Foster, and on behalf of CME Outfitters, I would like to welcome you today and thank you for joining us for today's educational activity entitled The Patient Voice, Defining Healthcare Disparities in Atopic Dermatitis. I would also like to note that today's program is supported by an educational grant from Sanofi Genzyme and Regeneron Pharmaceuticals. Today's activity is brought to you by CME Outfitters, an award-winning accredited prov provider of continuing education for clinicians worldwide. I would also like to encourage everyone to join us today on our live Twitter conversation at CME Outfitters. We'll be monitoring the Twitter feed and responding to your tweets as they come in. And one last item I want to note is that we're using an enhanced platform today that allows you to save slides, take notes on slides, answer polling questions, and send us your questions. Please look at the tabs on your screen and give us your feedback um, on the program and the platform as well. So as I mentioned, my name is Jenna Lester. I'm an assistant professor um, in the Department of Dermatology at the University of California, San Francisco, and I'm also the director of the Skin of Color program in the department. Um, I'd like to take this time to welcome my colleague, Dr. Junko Takeshita, um, who's an assistant professor of dermatology and assistant professor of epidemiology at the University of Pennsylvania Perelman School of Medicine in Philadelphia. Welcome, Junko, and thanks for joining me today. Thanks, Jenna. I'm happy to be here and have this discussion with you today. Great. Um, so uh, I want to begin today with the reason we're all here, uh, the patient. Prior to the program, um, uh, Junko and I partnered with CME Outfitters to survey patients with atopic dermatitis or their caregivers who've experienced disparities in their care firsthand to get their feedback about their journey. The first audio clip is about the burden of disease and challenges in receiving an accurate assessment for some patients with atopic dermatitis. Let's listen. She was about nine years old and I noticed that she was having a lot of redness and itchiness, always complaining about itchiness of her skin and everything that we tried didn't work. When she turned 10, we went back to the doctor because we tried home remedies and he diagnosed her with atopic dermatitis. It caused me a great deal of distress because it affected my appearance, but it was not properly diagnosed and treated until my college years. I do not feel like that dermatologist or any of the dermatologists I have visited accurately diagnosed or treated or really addressed my skin issues as a woman of color. It took nearly 15 years to get diagnosed and it was a long time before I could get referral to a dermatologist. I believe this is the experience for most patients who often begin their symptoms in childhood or infancy and may not get diagnosed till at least five to 10 years later and without seeing a specialist. So as we've just heard from the patients themselves, our first learning objective is an important starting point which is to recognize the clinical presentation of atopic dermatitis uh, and its impact on the quality of life for patients of color. But first, uh, we'd like to ask you, the audience, how confident do you feel in assessing disease severity of atopic dermatitis in people of color? Not confident, somewhat confident, confident, or very confident. Uh, please vote now. Thanks for your participation. And it, it appears that the majority of the audience who responded is not confident in uh, assessing the severity of atopic dermatitis in people of color. Uh, and I'm happy that you all tuned in today. So hopefully by the end of this presentation, we'll be able to shift some of these numbers a little bit towards more of the confident end of the spectrum. Um, and we know that a little bit about prevalence of atopic dermatitis in the United States and why this is so important. It's important that we're all comfortable diagnosing this in all patients. Um, in pediatric patients, the prevalence is about 20%, whereas in adults, uh, it's estimated at 10.2%. And we know in the pediatric population, it's highest among African-American and Black patients. 
Black patients are more likely to have untreated or treatment resistant atopic dermatitis. And atopic dermatitis in skin of color is misdiagnosed or diagnosed later in disease progression. Um, and this can lead to poorer outcomes, which are compounded by comorbidities or other health disparities. Now, um, Chunko, you've done considerable research in this area. What can you tell us about the impact of these disparities on um, children? So Jenna, here's a brief summary of what we know. As you already mentioned, specifically among children in the United States, uh, based on population-based data, they, they suggest that the prevalence of eczema is higher among Black children than white children. And in this instance, I'm purposely using the term eczema because, the lack of, because of the lack of specificity with which the skin disease was defined in these particular studies. So we're not sure that these individuals had true sort of quote-unquote atopic dermatitis. Now, there are other factors that have been suggested to be associated with higher prevalence of atopic dermatitis or eczema in children, including living in metropolitan areas and higher household education levels. But these associations aren't always consistent across all of the studies. Now, among adults, the prevalence of eczema has been noted to be higher among women compared to men and among individuals with higher education levels in limited studies. And in general, we know much less about atopic dermatitis in adults than we do in children. With regards to disease severity, Black and Hispanic children have also been noted to be more likely to have moderate to severe disease, as shown in this graph that summarizes data from the 2007 National Survey of Children's Health. But these racial and ethnic differences in disease severity appear to be driven by other factors that are shown in this table, such as lower household income levels and poor maternal health, each of which is associated with more severe eczema. So when accounting for these factors in these studies, the racial and ethnic differences in eczema severity that we saw in the previous slide disappear. Now, there are also racial and ethnic disparities in healthcare use as shown in this slide among children with eczema. Using data from the medical expenditure panel surveys, we, my group has found that black children were less likely to have any outpatient visit for their skin disease compared to white children. And these findings were adjusted for any differences in socioeconomic status and other atopic diseases across the groups. Now, even among those who are accessing care for their atopic dermatitis, we have found disparities in healthcare use in a study that, again, my group performed that included about 7,500 children enrolled in the pediatric eczema elective registry. In general, what we found was that Black and Hispanic children were about three times more likely to receive medical care for their skin disease across most levels of disease control. We also specifically found that Black and Hispanic children were more likely to see a primary care provider or go to the emergency room for their atopic dermatitis than white children, even with similar levels of disease control. And Black children with poorly controlled atopic dermatitis were less likely to see a dermatologist for their skin disease than white children with similarly poorly controlled disease. Beyond these suggested disparities in disease burden and healthcare use, we've also found that Black and Hispanic children are more likely to have school absences because of their atopic dermatitis than white children. And this is just one indication of the impact that atopic dermatitis can have on children's or adults' lives. So Jenna, please tell us more about the impact that atopic dermatitis has on a person's life, especially the mental health and emotional aspects of a person's well-being. Well, we know that um, post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation is one of the um, one notable sequela of inflammation in the skin. And um, in atopic, atopic dermatitis is no exception to this. And this has been shown uh, in patients with skin of color to increase their distress because of the discoloration that results from their active or previously active areas of disease involvement. Um, we also know that chronic moderate to severe atopic dermatitis can really be debilitating and is linked to issues with mental, mental health across all uh, races. But adults with atopic dermatitis specifically are more likely to develop depression. And there's actually what is called a dose response relationship. So the higher the severity of atopic dermatitis, the more the, the uh, more severe the depression. And there's also an increase of in anxiety as well. Um, 
in a review of 15 studies of patients with atopic dermatitis, it was found that there is an increase in suicidal ideation and um, suicide attempts as well. So this together highlights the significance of this disease and the ramifications that it has and potential danger to the patient when it comes to the, um, their, their mental health and mental well-being. Now, um, before we continue, let's hear more from the patients themselves about the immense disease burden that can occur with atopic dermatitis. Um, we'll listen to two more audio clips. Emotional pain derives from this. Whenever somebody treats you like you're some kind of a dirty <laughs> beast, if you will, for not having perfectly clear skin, you definitely feel judged and you feel like an outsider upon society. And it hurts quite a lot. I would say my atopic dermatitis slash eczema has held me back in so many different ways because when you have a serious skin condition, you cannot live a normal life. Every single thing that you do, you have to think twice about if your skin is going to flare up or if it's going to react to a chemical or something that you eat or anything. So many different elements to why eczema plays a mental toll on your health. And let's face it, the world is not set up for people that have chronic skin conditions. I'm really happy we have these clips because they really bring to life some of the issues that our patients deal with that sometimes we don't have time in the office to really elicit from them. So hopefully these are helpful in focusing on why this is such an important issue for us to address. Uh, Junko, you were part of a research study on quality of life for Black adults with atopic dermatitis. How were these findings significant? We wanted to know if there might be differences in the quality of life impact of atopic dermatitis by race or ethnicity. And in this study, which is not yet published, we used data from the atopic dermatitis in America study. This is an online survey study of American adults with atopic dermatitis. And we compared the impact of atopic dermatitis on their quality of life as measured by the commonly used dermatology life quality index instrument. And we compared this by race and ethnicity. What we found, as shown in the table on the left, and then also um, in adjusted results on the right, was that particularly among those with greater symptoms of anxiety or depression, which we already talked about is common among individuals with atopic dermatitis, Black adults with atopic dermatitis had 75% higher DLQI scores than white adults with atopic dermatitis, where higher scores equate to a larger impact on quality of life. So our study, though limited by most individuals in this study having mild atopic dermatitis, does provide some support that the quality of life burden of atopic dermatitis may be larger specifically among Black adults. Now, we don't know exactly why quality of life burden due to atopic dermatitis may differ by race or ethnicity, but some considerations could include different disease severities across the groups due to missed diagnoses, for example. And certainly other studies have shown greater objective disease severity as measured by instruments such as the PO score ad or the POEM score has been associated with poor mental health and greater quality of life impact. I will note, however, in our, our particular study that I showed you in the last slide, we did account for differences in disease severity. So there may be other factors that explain racial differences in quality of life impact. Other aspects of atopic dermatitis in general that contribute to poor quality of life include the associated symptoms such as pain and discomfort, skin discoloration, and other comorbidities such as infections. Now, Jenna, I want to turn back to you. We've been learning more about how biases and gaps in medical education, which could be considered, considered structural um, uh, or, or components of structural racism can contribute to health and healthcare disparities. You've done some work in this area. How is this a factor in dermatologic care? Well, I think this is quite significant um, and is something that we're building the evidence base for uh, more recently. But a survey of 47% of US dermatologists and dermatology residents said their training was inadequate to allow them to identify and treat skin conditions and darker skin tones, which if you think about it, that's pretty significant. That means that almost half of dermatologists and dermatology residents feel like they don't have adequate training to look at a significant portion of the patients that potentially could present to them and treat, identify and treat skin conditions in those skin tones. So um, I just wanna like take a moment to let that statistic settle in for a second. Uh, and 
we know that skin of color is underrepresented in dermatology texts and clinical images. Um, and there have been several um, analyses done on this. And a more recent analysis shows that 4.5% of images in medical textbooks show darker skin types. And in our profession, um, our specialty where a lot of what we learn about is through photos and this, you know, iteration of seeing photo after photo and training your eye to identify things if you're not seeing it in clinic, that's pretty significant that we don't see um, darker skin with a higher, a higher frequency. Um, and then in a recent study uh, in, at University of Colorado that was shown that medical students correctly identified atopic dermatitis and other dermatologic conditions more frequently in Fitzpatrick skin type one through three, as opposed to Fitzpatrick skin type four through six. So they're better able to identify skin disease, including atopic dermatitis and light skin as compared to dark skin. Um, and this held true even, even with um, students who identified as having skin of color or darker skin. Um, they were also, it, they were no more able to, um, to accurately diagnose skin disease and darker skin than their um, Fitzpatrick one through three counterparts. Although the, the, the uh, numbers for, um, for that group was much lower, 92 versus 29. So um, uh, the authors suggested further studies needed in this area to really see the differences there. Um, Jenna, we have a question from the audience um, that asks what role structural racism and social determinants of health may play in the higher prevalence of atopic dermatitis in children that we see among the Black population. Do you want to comment on what we might know about this? Well, um, I think a lot of this is things that we know from the research that you've done, Junko, and um, understanding, you know, dwellings where people commonly live and what their li living environments are like and how that could tie into common um, triggers for atopic dermatitis. So um, this is something, again, I'm happy for the question asking about social determinants of health and structural racism playing into severity of atopic dermatitis, because we think that this is what is central to the differences that we might be seeing as opposed to um, some other unsubstantiated explanation. I completely agree. And I, I am also glad for this question because we know that the social determinants of health are the main causes of health disparities. And I will say we're really at the tip of the iceberg in dermatology in general in terms of understanding uh, what role social determinants of health play in dermatologic outcomes. So I think, you know, more to come as people research this more. Uh, certainly we have hypotheses, I think, that could lead to different exposures that could exacerbate skin disease but hopefully more data to come. Okay, so now that we have discussed the racial and ethnic disparities and disease burden and healthcare utilization for atopic dermatitis, let's move on to our second learning objective. Implement best practices to diagnose, evaluate, and treat atopic dermatitis in children and adult patients of color. Let's also start this section by hearing from two patients to describe their own experiences with being diagnosed with atopic dermatitis. Due to the color of my skin, I am Latina and I have darker skin. I think that there was some initial maybe misdiagnosis as to what was going on. That they thought maybe dry skin, and this is through my general practitioner. It was not until I went to the dermatologist that they were able to give me an accurate description. I do not feel like my dermatologists or primary care physicians over the years have been skilled in diagnosing skin disorders in persons of color. I, I don't think that they get adequate education in medical school and continuing education is lacking in how these issues present on darker skin for persons of color. Now, unfortunately, these patients' experiences are not that uncommon. In order to understand the role that dermatologists might play in contributing to potential disparities in the diagnosis, assessment, and treatment of atopic dermatitis, my group performed a survey study of a random sample of over 3,000 dermatologists in the United States, presenting them with one of eight survey options that each presented an 18-year-old with atopic dermatitis that affected 15% of their body surface area and had only been treated with topical steroids. Each survey option differed only in the patient's gender, race, or socioeconomic status using job as a, or parent's job as a proxy, 
and was accompanied by one of the standard headshots and a corresponding clinical photo shown here. And the survey asked dermatologists how confident they were in the diagnosis of atopic dermatitis, how severe the atopic dermatitis was, and what treatment they recommended. Please note that I'm sharing this uh, with uh, sharing this unpublished these unpublished results with you. Uh, this table summarizes what we found with respect to differences between assessing and treating a white versus black patient with atopic dermatitis. And we didn't find any significant differences in the confidence in diagnosing atopic dermatitis between black and white patients. But we did find that dermatologists who received the black patient survey were much less likely to identify the patient as having severe disease compared to dermatologists who received the white patient survey. Similarly, dermatologists who received the black patient survey were less likely, likely to recommend treatment that's consistent with more severe disease, such as phototherapy, oral systemic therapies, or biologic therapy than dermatologists who received the white patient survey. And this was largely due to not identifying the black patient as having severe disease. So a number of you indicated uh, uh, some discomfort with assessing atopic dermatitis and darker skin types. And you can see you're not alone, even among dermatologists. So our survey study identified differences in disease severity assessment in lighter versus darker skin that can have important treatment implications. Jenna, what have you seen in your own practice regarding the differences in atopic dermatitis signs and symptoms in people of color? And how can we overcome challenges in disease severity assessments due to different skin tones? Well, um, I think some of the patient vignettes, as well as your research, has highlighted nicely the combination of factors that can lead to um, missed diagnoses. And um, the clinical diagnosis is an extremely important part of that. Uh, we know that atopic, we know that inflammation appears differently in uh, dark skin, and atopic dermatitis um, is an example of this. Um, we are primed in how we um, see or recognize skin disease based on what we read in textbooks as well. And our, the descriptions in textbooks are often labeled as classic and based off of how skin disease appears in white skin. So salmon colored or shades of pink to red. And if that is what's echoing in your mind as you're looking at the disease on someone's skin, it might make it much more difficult for you to identify something as eczema or another inflammatory skin disease and dark skin. Atopic dermatitis related um, erythema can be much more difficult to detect on non-white skin. Uh, and this is due to a number of factors um, of color perception. Um, and erythema, it, it actually can appear grayish um, or dark brown, red brown, magenta. Um, and post-inflammatory areas or even actively inflamed areas can be hyperpigmented or hypopigmented. Now, um, this is directly related to um, the ways that we score uh, severity of disease in uh, atopic dermatitis. And we have a number of um, disease severity scales, the SCORAD, uh, Scoring Atopic Dermatitis Index, the Easy Score, Eczema Area and Severity Index, and the IGA or the Investigator's Global Assessment. Um, and each of these contains an erythema as part of their measurement. Um, we can measure the impact on quality of life with the DLQI, which um, Junko mentioned earlier, but there are a number of scales that uh, measure the quality of life and psychological outcomes in atopic dermatitis. And then we have symptom specific measure like the POEM or patient oriented eczema measure. Um, and then the peak puritis numerical rating scale, um, which includes a pain and um, sleep on a scale of one to 10. And it's also important to note that we have uh, sc scales to measure um, how someone is doing in terms of their mental health. Uh, the HAD score, uh, the hospital anxiety and depression scale, and the PHQ-2 or the PHQ-9, uh, the patient health questionnaire uh, to assess for depression. Now, uh, erythema scoring can mask atopic dermatitis severity in skin of color. Uh, not something that I, that I mentioned in reference to our different severity scoring tools. Um, each one of them measures erythema as part of their severity. And assessment challenges because of skin pigmentation, which is demonstrated here in the photos on the right, 
can make it difficult to identify um, erythema in um, patients of color. So um, you can see in photos A and B, uh, although photo B, the lighting is a little bit darker, which is another issue that we encounter quite regularly. Um, the, the, the erythema or inflammation in the skin is a little bit more difficult to identify when you compare it to photos C and D, where you can see bright red to pink um, coloration of the skin as opposed to hyperpigmentation or a more violaceous appearance in photos A and B. And this inability to identify the um, erythema, which is something that many dermatologists or clinicians in general have difficulty with, can skew the assessment um, of, of the visual diagnosis with the SCORED index or other tools. Um, and we, we can use other sort of clinical signs, patient reported outcome tools, this three item severity index of er or excoriations, erythema and edema or population. Um, and we know that a, a recent study has shown that there's an increased risk for severe atopic dermatitis in black children after we adjust for the erythema score. So this is, demonstrates the theory that, um, th that when we use measures that include erythema, we're sort of underscoring patients of color in terms of their severity. Uh, one other tip is that you can compare lesions and lesional skin to non-lesional skin for a more accurate um, atopic dermatitis assessment. Although if you're seeing someone for the first time and trying to determine how much body surface area involvement they have, that could be difficult for you to do um, because you're not maybe not entirely sure where the non-lesional skin is. So um, this is something to keep in mind. Now, um, Junko, what recommendations do you have for um, assessing patients with moderate to severe atopic dermatitis? There are many factors that we need to take into account when assessing any patient with atopic dermatitis, uh, many of which are summarized in this schematic here. First of all, not only do we need to measure the disease severity from an objective standpoint, for example, based on appearance of the lesions or distribution or body surface area involvement, but we also need to ask the patient how the disease is affecting their life. It's also important to provide general education about atopic dermatitis, for example, good dry skin care, uh, the importance of emollient and topical medication use, adequately balancing the risks and benefits of topical steroid use and other treatments as just some examples. Now, in most situations, we want to start with an adequate trial of intensive topical therapy, which includes appropriate medium to high potency topical steroid or other topical anti-inflammatory for up to about a four-week time period. And then we sometimes consider what I like to call soak and smear therapy for more severe cases. We also want to make sure that we don't forget to consider alternative diagnoses, especially when there are any atypical presentations or unexpected responses to therapy, especially among patients with atopic dermatitis. We should always be thinking about whether an infection is driving or worsening the disease, whether there might be an allergic component, whether other atopic comorbidities are being appropriately managed, such as asthma. And sometimes we have to question, is this even atopic dermatitis at all? For example, drug reactions or uh, a more rare condition called cutaneous T-cell lymphoma can look like eczema, to name just a few other con uh, dermatologic con uh, considerations. Now, in the next slide, we look at the treatment algorithms that have been suggested, and these can also help in managing patients with atopic dermatitis. And so in situations where an adequate trial of topical therapy is not sufficient to manage a patient's disease, or when there's a severe quality of life impact, then other non-topical therapies should be considered. And these include things like phototherapy, dupilumab, and oral systemic therapies, which are listed here, many of which are immunosuppressive as well. Now, in general, we like to recommend uh, that a patient trial one of these non-topical therapies for about three months, assuming there are no adverse side effects, before declaring therapy failure or poor response to therapy. It's also important, as somebody asked um, in, in the questions, actually, to consider multidisciplinary care for other atopic comorbidities, such as asthma or uh, seasonal allergies or allergic rhinitis, 
Or if a primary care provider is managing a patient with more severe atopic dermatitis, and in particular, if they don't feel comfortable with the more severe disease, to get a dermatologist involved. So this is an example of what clinicians are recommended to do in their management of patients with atopic dermatitis. But what are the patient's experiences with and perceptions of treatment? Let's hear from our patients again. Considering that there's not too much medication to help eczema at the moment, as far as I'm aware, other than topical steroids, I don't believe it was the doctor's fault, but more the amount of variety of medication for atopic dermatitis. Most dermatologists that you come across, this is not a patient-doctor communication. This is a doctor knows best, and the patient is just there to take what is given to them. There are a couple of things I want to note about what these patients shared. First, I think the first patient highlights the knowledge gap that exists among patients with regards to the growing number of options we have to treat, especially more severe atopic dermatitis. And the second patient brings to light an unfortunate experience of more of a one-way rather than two-way conversation with their dermatologist. And ideally, we we really want this to be a shared decision-making process between a patient and their clinician in deciding on a management plan. These experiences can have major impacts on the treatments that patients receive in real life and can contribute to treatment disparities. In fact, in one single center study of about 20,000 adults with atopic dermatitis between 2013 and 2018, some differences in treatment patterns were noted between black and white patients where black patients were less likely than white patients to be treated with non-steroidal topicals or dupilumab as shown in this, particularly in the graph on the left. Now, while this study didn't account for likely existing differences in sociodemographic factors, such as income and insurance, that may actually be causing these racial differences, we are seeing here um, that there is a potential treatment disparity that deserves further investigation. Jenna, what are your thoughts about these findings and what might be some of the reasons for these treatment differences? Well, um... I think there could be several things. And I think, as you mentioned, we need more investigation into this, but um, I think I'm thinking about a lot of the other data that you, that you've already presented and the fact that um, black patients are less likely to be seeing a dermatologist for the, their atopic dermatitis care. This could impact the, the, um, the prescriptions that they're getting. Someone in Someone in the um, questions um, is a primary care physician and they ask if they can, can prescribe dupilumab or should they refer these severe atopic dermatitis um, patients to a dermatologist if access is an, and availability is an issue in their small town. And I would imagine that there are a number of other providers who feel the same way. And they're like, you know, it takes six months for my patient to get in to see a dermatologist. Should I just prescribe the dupilumab? And maybe in the end they don't because they don't feel comfortable. Um, and I know that I face a lot of issues getting some of these medications covered, but as someone that prescribes them quite frequently and who has um, help from pharmacists within our department getting these medications covered, we're often able to. But outside of the dermatology environment, I could see how that might be an issue. Um, so, you know, I think that that possibly is, um, it can account for um, some of these differences. But I, I do think, um, more investigation is necessary. Now, uh, one of the more alarming aspects of the COVID-19 pandemic is the disproportionate harm that it's caused in um, historically marginalized groups in the United States. The pandemic has had less visible effects on diagnosing and managing atopic dermatitis and other dermatologic skin conditions, but um, this brings us to our third learning objective, which is to evaluate the latest evidence regarding healthcare disparities in patients with atopic dermatitis and the impact of COVID-19 on the care for patients of color with atopic dermatitis. Um, first, let's pull you the audience about one effect of the pandemic across healthcare, which is an increase in telehealth. So how confident do you use, do you feel using telehealth to assess atopic dermatitis in people of color? Not confident, somewhat confident, confident, or very confident. 
And it looks like the majority of the audience does not feel confident using telehealth to assess atopic dermatitis in um, people of color. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's good, again, to realize that you're not alone in this, even among um, other dermatologists. Uh, in, in terms of the impact that COVID-19 has had on atopic dermatitis care, in a global web-based survey of 733 dermatologists, uh, we, we found that it was found that um, there's been a decrease in in-person consultations, a decrease in in-office procedures, but an increase in telehealth or teledermatology use, 75% um, now post-pandemic or intra-pandemic as compared to pre-pandemic. Uh, and 68.6% .6 of surveyed dermatologists expect to use teledermatology in the future. So uh, it's, it's pretty important that we all recognize the limitations of this or the, the, the issues that this can cause as it seems to be something that many of, of us plan to continue to use. And it indicates a profound and immediate impact on dermatology care, um, although we don't know the true effect on atopic dermatitis care at this time. So um, the chart on the right shows uh, in, in, uh, interesting information on the utilization of telehealth as opposed to other forms um, of care for different patient groups. Um, and as mentioned in the previous slide, there's been an unprecedented expansion in telehealth. So it's really important for us to understand these trends and figure out how we can improve them. Um, there's many benefits to telehealth that we've all discovered. You know, we were able to work more safely from home during the height of the pandemic as we were figuring out what the appropriate PPE was for us to be using and waiting for supply chains to be able to, um, to provide those for us. Uh, but there are some issues that are worth discussing. Elderly adults, um, adults of lower socioeconomic status, and uh, minority, the minority population are disadvantaged when it comes to telehealth. So you can see in the chart on the right that Black, African-American, as well as um, Hispanic and Latinx patients are more likely to use the ER than they are to use telehealth or another um, uh, practice setting uh, for, for assessment of their, um, uh, of their skin disease. Um, and patients with limited English proficiency have lower rates of use of telehealth as compared to those who are proficient in English, which makes sense because many of our platforms are not, um, do, do not translate into other languages. Um, and there's also a built-in racial bias in webcams and photography that might be part of what accounts for the fact that many of us don't feel comfortable assessing a skin disease that already has subtle presentations and subtle um, signs of severity in patients with dark skin. And then when you add into it with internet bandwidth with issues and um, patient decided lighting um, settings, it can make it even more difficult. Now, um, Dr. Takeshita, um, telehealth as we, can see is likely here to stay and will likely be used much more than we did before this pandemic. Uh, what tools can we implement to improve telehealth dermatolo teledermatology experience for patients um, and providers? Yeah, I think this is a great question that also some of the audience members are um, asking. And so because of the challenges um, with regards to telehealth, teledermatology, that relate to you know, adequately visualizing the skin for a proper examination, patient reported outcome measures may be quite useful in helping the clinician understand the severity or burden of disease in a patient who's being seen remotely. Some of these patient reported outcome instruments can include things like the PO score ad, DLQI, NRS itch to measure itch symptoms and POEM among others that we have mentioned throughout this talk. And these all measure different aspects of atopic dermatitis from the patient perspective. Now, unfortunately, there isn't a single patient reported outcome measure that captures all aspects of atopic dermatitis and its impact on a patient. So often one has to pick and choose which one or ones you want to use. And then lastly, especially among the measures that require a patient to provide an evaluation of the characteristics of their own skin 
It's important that adequate training is provided to patients on what to look for, not only on light skin, but across the spectrum of skin tones, as we've already seen some of the potential limitations and challenges of assessing disease severity in darker skin types using these instruments. Now, the reason why we've been using so much telehealth is because of the COVID-19 pandemic, as, as we've mentioned already. And in light of this, I want to very briefly address the considerations for treating atopic dermatitis in the setting of COVID-19. Now, as a reminder, uh, this, this was the treatment algorithm that we, we reviewed in the previous objective. And with regards to COVID-19 and specifically atopic dermatitis outcomes and care, there's still a lot we don't know. And most recommendations at this point are really based on expert opinion. In general, topical therapy is considered to be safe to start or continue during the pandemic for atopic dermatitis. With regards to systemic therapy, we do have some general evidence that shows that higher doses of systemic steroids do substantially increase the risk of COVID-19. So systemic steroids should be used sparingly and at the lowest dose necessarily, necessary and for the shortest duration needed overall and for our patients with atopic dermatitis. And that dose, dose threshold is thought to be 10 milligrams per day. Now, what about other systemic therapies for more severe atopic dermatitis, many of which are immunosuppressive? Now, this is a topic that really to cover sufficiently is beyond the scope of our discussion today, but in general, this is really a decision that should be made on a case-by-case -case basis between the patient and his or her healthcare provider to really carefully weigh the risks and benefits of each treatment option in the setting of the, the patient's particular scenario. Now with dupilumab being a leading treatment option for patients with moderate to severe atopic dermatitis, let's talk more specifically about um, some data we have on this treatment. Jenna, what data do we have on using dupilumab to treat atopic dermatitis among patients of color? So um, dupilumab, which um, many of you know, is a um, anti-IL-4, IL-13 um, medication that is beneficial because it's not an immunosuppressant and also um, is a treatment option for patients above the age of six. Um, so it's, it, it has um, pretty variable um, um, it, uh, applications for that reason. And in an open label study of continuous treatment um, sorry, in an open label study, we see that there was continuous treatment improvement that sustained for up to three years in adults. Um, now, it's important to note that in this study, the, um, the uh, number of patients who were um, considered to have skin of color were lower than we'd like it to be, but um, it is data that we have um, in terms of how this drug performs on a long-term basis. Uh, we know that there are adverse events for any medication, uh, and dupilumab is no exception. And those are commonly are nasopharyngitis, conjunctivitis, headache, headache, oral herpes, or injection site reactions. And to answer the question from um, that um, someone asked earlier about, as a primary care physician, can you prescribe this medication? I think this really depends on comfort level. And I think that there are even some dermatologists who may decide to make a referral instead of prescribing this themselves. I think it is um, because it doesn't require um, a long-term drug monitoring. It's something that if you become comfortable with it, you may feel confident enough to do that. And I think it certainly, as we can see, provides benefit for your patient. So if you're in a um, small town, as I think the the person asking this question is, uh, and, it's, and it would be a significant weight for um, a dermatologist, this is something to consider. Now, in another study specifically looking at efficacy um, in, with, use, in atopic dermatitis using dupilumab um, for moderate to severe AD um, by race, uh, we've, they, they found that there was um, an improvement in all assessed outcomes in white and Asian subgroups. And um, in the smaller black subgroup, there was a um, statistically significant improvement in the easy endpoints, mean changes in peak puritis, and in the um, DLQI index indices. So, um, so this suggests that this is well, well tolerated and acceptable safety profile in all subgroups based on the information that we have now. Of course, I, I think that we could always have 
increased representation in these studies and um, people from broad racial and ethnic backgrounds um, in order to be to make sure that these data are truly um, generalizable. Um, but based on what we have now, we know that these um, medicate this medication is safe. Now, in this case report. Um, we see that a 53-year-old Black man with one-year history of worsening periodic rash on his trunk um, that was uh, diagnosed as moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. Uh, and this patient received a 600 milligram loading dose of dupilumab, and then two weeks later, a 200 milligram dose, and subsequently received this um, subcutaneously every two weeks. Uh, and experienced an improvement in all of his symptoms, including hyperpigmentation during treatment. Um, I don't know about you, Junko, but my typical dosing is 300 milligrams for every two weeks for the maintenance phase. It's unclear to me why this patient got 200 milligrams, but it was noted that as they tried to increase the interval at which they were giving the maintenance, the patient experienced a flare, which um, led them to go back down to every two weeks dosing. And perhaps this, um, that could be one reason why. But um, in any case, um, that's an interesting report to have alongside the data that was presented. Yeah, I agree with you, Jenna. I, I typically use standard uh, dosing for dupilumab um, as well. So thank you, Jenna, for this great discussion. Uh, this brings our formal presentation portion of our program to an end. And before we open it up to questions, I'd like to provide a summary of some take-home points to consider in addressing healthcare disparities related to atopic dermatitis. First, it is important to identify the inequitable processes that contribute to racial and ethnic differences in the prevalence, assessment, and treatment of atopic dermatitis, both in children and among adults. Once we identify those processes, we certainly want to implement procedures, um, policies, so that we can address these disparities. And one of those things is integrating best practices or treatment algorithms into our daily practice. This, this can certainly help address and ultimately eliminate disparities in the diagnosis, assessment, and management of moderate to severe atopic dermatitis, particularly in patients of color. And lastly, we should take care to continuously assess changes in dermatologic practices and treatment due to the COVID-19 pandemic and any other factors that may arise, especially those that might exacerbate existing health inequities. So now that we have concluded our formal discussion, let's go to your questions. We've received a number of questions already and hopefully we've addressed some of them in our discussion and please continue to, to submit your comments by clicking on the ask question tab. You can also tweet to at CME Outfitters. Okay, so let's look at some of your burning questions. Um, how often do you as a dermatologist work with allergists or maybe other specialists to manage atopic dermatitis, particularly in children? Jenna, do you want to start with how you how you approach this? Sure. Um, I would say because I'm primarily an adult dermatologist, it's something that I don't do as frequently. Um, but as we discussed in our um, treatment algorithm, when you're treating someone and you're doing the typical topical therapy, or even if you've um, moved away from that and are, um, you know, using systemic therapy uh, or even uh, phototherapy, if you're finding that the case is still recalcitrant to treatment or there are certain areas that are not clearing, I think considering other things like contact dermatitis or a contribution from a systemic uh, um, intrinsic um, allergy um, is, is is appropriate. And in that case, I may involve an allergist. What do you do, Junko? Yeah, I agree. I mean, uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, or fortunately, I, I am also not a pediatric dermatologist. And so I don't see children. Um, so you're, get, you're getting an answer from another adult dermatologist. But I take a similar approach. You know, I, I sort of assess each patient as they come. And, um, you know, if, if there is a concern, particularly for some sort of allergy that may be contributing to or exacerbating the disease, I think it's absolutely appropriate um, to refer to an allergist and get some input. Um, additionally, you know, if the, the patient has sort of com comorbid allergic rhinitis or other allergies, which are quite common among these populations, um, absolutely getting a specialist on board. And I think, uh, you know, sort of similar approach to individuals who have comorbid asthma also. Mm -hmm. 
So there have been a number of questions with regards to patient reported outcomes, as well as, you know, instruments to measure disease severity, both in general, you know, what do we use, what's recommended, and then also, you know, how do we best use these instruments in patients of color? Maybe I'll take a I'll take an initial stab at this, and then I'll ask you what you do, Jenna. With regards to uh, disease severity measures, you know there are a lot of really great ones out there. I think for me in my practice, the main limiting factor is how long the instrument is um, and how much time it's going to take. So from the standpoint of you know um, not taking up too much time and simplicity, I personally measure a body surface area, and then I also do uh, a global assessment. Um, and so that's my approach in terms of instruments. Um, maybe we'll tackle the, the tips and how to approach this among patients with uh, darker skin types next. And I'll, I'll ask you, Jenna, what instruments you use first. Um, I also uh, think that it's helpful to have a more objective measure. So for that, I tend to use um, um, to, to measure a body surface area or estimate a body surface area. But um, I, I tend to find the peak puritis score to be quite helpful. Um, especially because it allows the patient to express how this is impacting them and um, um, give sort of a patient assessment on how this is impacting sleep and pain, et cetera. And so we have both a more objective sort of um, um, investigator or physician generated data point, as well as a patient generated data point that both of which we can track over time. Um, and, and the next question was about um, looking in, um, assessment in patients with darker skin types. Um, and I can, I can explain how I um, approach that. Um, first, I, I think lighting is incredibly important and making sure your, you know, natural light is the most, um, the best way to see any skin type, I think. So getting near a window or if a patient is sending you a photo, having them go outside. Um, but and, and that's because there are some contour and some skin textural changes that might be the only thing you see, follicular prominence, um, patchlessness of the, uh, of the um, eccrine um, uh, glands. You can see swelling around the um, adnexal structures in the skin um, and, and very subtle erythema occasionally um, can be um, observed. Uh, and I also sometimes ask the patients if it's difficult for me to tell does this skin look normal to you? Does this skin look more red to you? Because um, they're often a, a, a good um, measure of that as well. Um, Junko, how do you approach this? Yeah, I absolutely have a similar approach. And I, I also really like to ask patients, you know, what, what does your unaffected, what does your quote unquote normal skin look like? Mm -hmm. And is this abnormal or, or normal to you? Um, because, you know, that's their skin and they're looking at it every day. So I think they're the best judge and can be really, really helpful. With regards to, you know, um, using the instruments and how we can better use them. I mean, I, I think from that standpoint, I, I think it's really education, making sure that people are using these instruments, know um, what to look for, what quote unquote erythema looks like in different skin types, and making sure also in the training modules for these instruments that we're looking at pictures of atopic dermatitis across the spectrum of skin types so that people really know what they're looking for in assessing. And I think that in part, you know, can answer some of the questions that have come in with regards to, you know, what can we do to address some of these disparities that we've talked about? I think a lot of it is education. What are your thoughts, Jenna? I totally agree. Um, I, education is incredibly important. Awareness of these issues so that we, um, have more balanced image representation in our in publications. Um, and yeah, I think there, there are lots of different ways that we educate. And I think we often think of medical students and residents, but continuing medical education is the way that the ma vast majority of our specialty um, who are not residents are getting their information going forward. So we need to think about these venues as well as being an important um, intervention in that way, so. Education is central. So there is also a question about whether any of the topical therapies might be more or less efficacious in um, individuals with lighter versus darker skin types. 
Um, what are your thoughts on this, Jenna? I don't know of any um, any studies that have explored this. Um, I always think the most effective treatment is the one that the patient is going to use. So making sure that your patient's medication is covered and that they're picking it up from the pharmacy and using it, that seems like a, a no-brainer, but it still is an issue. And oftentimes, I don't know if a, if a patient actually picks their medication up. So making sure that they're actually accessing the prescriptions that you're prescribing. Um, do you know of any research on this, Junko? Yeah, I, I agree with you completely. I'm not aware of any differences in efficacy across different skin types. I, I think the, the other thing to make your patients, particularly darker skin types, aware of is the discoloration that can result from using topical steroids so that, that they're aware of that potential expectation, you know, and, and that's something that we don't see in individuals who are using topical steroids um, in, in lighter skin types. Mm -hmm. Excellent point. So I think that we are coming to the end of our time today. Um, I, you know, thank you all for your attention and really great questions. This was really an engaging discussion. Um, before we close, please note that CME Outfitters has a dermatology hub with a number of excellent resources for clinicians and patients. So please feel free to visit this site for more information. And to receive CME or CE credit for today's program, please complete the post-test and evaluation, and you'll be able to download and print your certificate immediately upon com completion. Thank you again, Jenna, for joining me in discussing this very important topic. And thank you to our audience for participating and providing the best and most equitable care for our patients with atopic dermatitis.